Without further ado, tonight's program on yoga, a holistic approach to substance use disorder recovery, will be presented by Aaron Shago. Aaron is a therapist at Dawn Farm Outpatient Services and a co-owner and teacher at the, oh boy, pronunciation here. Iyengar. Iyengar. Iyengar Yoga Detroit Collective, a cooperatively owned yoga studio in Hamtramck. Aaron holds an intermediate junior certification in the Iyengar Method and certification with the International Association of Yoga Therapists. During her MSW program, Erin led independent research as part of her thesis studying the impact that yoga can have in, on women in residential substance use disorder treatment settings. Erin's yoga and therapy practices greatly inform one another and enrich her capacity as both a teacher and a therapist. So without further ado, let's give a big ad series. Welcome to Erin. <laughs> Uh, so I came into this getting to practice some yoga skills because our presentation is not working, uh, which was a great opportunity to refresh myself on my own nervous system and how I can control parts of it. <laughs> so bear with me. This is a PDF version of the presentation. Uh, I put a lot of time into a very unique Prezi version. Uh, unfortunately, this computer does not have Chrome, so we don't get to see the Prezi. But it'll be lovely, and the information is still all here. Um, and I'm happy you all are joining me tonight. So as Matt mentioned, I, uh, I work at Dawn Farm as a therapist. I have my license in social work. And then I also uh, teach and co-own a yoga studio in Hamtramck, Michigan. And so for a long time, I've been like dreaming about how do I merge these two fields that I'm both really passionate about, working as a therapist, working in recovery, and then also my passion as a yoga teacher and a person who practices yoga. And this is my first attempt at kind of what does it look like to present information on both these worlds. So I am very grateful that you all are here to join me for this new experience, and I hope that you give honest feedback, because uh, who knows, maybe I'll be presenting this information again and incorporating the information that you all give me, okay? Um, so a little bit about what's bringing me here before I get into the presentation. Um, <clears throat> I started practicing yoga probably 15 years ago when I was a teenager, um, I'm 30 now, so it's been a part of my life for more than half my life at this point. I started as a person who was recovering from being a gymnast, I had a lot of injuries, I could no longer do gymnastics, and I thought, oh, this is like a great physically therapeutic way to take care of my body, to maintain some of the flexibility, some of the strength that I had from my gymnastic practice. And I practiced on and off at home and in studios. My mom actually started taking me to like the local gym, the local fitness center to do yoga classes. And in my early 20s, I was hitting that kind of like early in life transition to adulthood. It was accompanied with a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, a lot of fear. And a close friend was teaching yoga at a local studio that she owned and invited me to join her. And it was this profound transformative experience that ended up turning into like a daily practice for me of doing yoga every morning from 6 to 7 a.m. in this like really regimented, disciplined way that I wish I was still doing it today. Uh, and I still do occasionally have that type of practice, but it, it turned something on in my body that felt brand new. And so going into my work as a therapist and going into my social work education, I knew that that was something I wanted to learn more about and figure out how do we bring this into more clinical settings, right? Because that was a transformation that through years of talk therapy, through years of, of communicating with friends and doing all this verbal and intellectual work, I wasn't able to achieve until I brought my body into the practice. And so some of what I'm going to be talking to you about tonight is uh, kind of included in what's happening in our body uh, that is important for folks in recovery and that's important in early recovery treatment. Also, where does some of the philosophy, philosophy of yoga really line up with culture of recovery and with some of the step work and work that we see happen in the 12 steps? <clears throat> and also, how does yoga interact with a lot of the clinical work being done in substance use disorder treatment settings today? So we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, I would like to start by doing a little bit of yoga. Do folks feel willing to stand up and join me? You can also do it from your seat if you don't want to stand up. Okay, so standing up if you'd like to. You can stay seated. These are all arm variations. So you can do them seated or standing. If you're standing or if you're seated, I invite you to plant your feet on the floor. They're planted. Okay. And you can stand with the feet hip width or together. If you stand with the feet together, you get this interesting sensation of getting to join the inner line of the legs so that the two legs can feel like one, right? Reach through all four points of each foot. So either side of the ball mound, right underneath the toes, either side of the heel. 
Squeeze the inner line of the legs together if you're standing in order to firm the fronts of the thighs. And now draw the navel back towards the spine. Lengthen the buttocks down towards the floor and lift the chest up towards the ceiling. Roll your shoulders back, and I'll do it with one hand. You all can do it with two. Extend your fingertips down towards the floor with the palms facing the thighs. Keep your chin level with the floor. Level the eyes. And on the inhalation, lift the breath into the chest as you press into the feet. All right, now inhale, reach your arms straight up. Point the fingertips to the ceiling. Reach again, the feet into the floor. Lift up through the legs. Draw the navel back, and then extend the fingertips all the way to the ceiling. Tighten up your elbows so you straighten the arms. And release the arms down again. Okay, now this one I don't know how to show with a mic in my hands. But interlock the fingers. And now turn the thumbs towards the chest. Push the palms away from you with the fingers still interlocked. Good. Get the webbings of the fingers nice and tight together. Point the thumb tips towards each other. Now inhale, reach the arms up and overhead. So again, press into the feet. Straighten the legs, squeezing the inner thighs together. Draw the navel back, and then as you lift the chest on the inhale, push the elbows up towards the ceiling, lifting the tops of the shoulders to the ears, and then release the arms. Now change your interlock. Have your opposite thumb on top. So your opposite thumb will be on top, and the fingers will alternate, will alternate from there. Feels a little weird, huh? Probably don't hold your hands like that very often. All right, so again, inhale, reach the arms up. Press into the feet. Tighten up the legs. Draw the navel back and reach the chest up as you lift the shoulders to the ears, reach the wrists to the ceiling, and then release the arms. All right, last one. How do I do this one with, with the mic in my hand? Reach the left hand behind the back and take hold of the right elbow or wrist. And then reach your right hand to take hold of the left elbow or wrist. So you're holding both your elbows. Here, I'm going to set the mic down for a second and show you. So you can either hold the arms like this or like this if you can't reach the elbows. Sorry, Dale. <laughs> All right, and then with holding the elbows or wrists, press into the feet, squeeze the legs together, draw the navel back towards your forearms, and then lift your chest up as you roll the shoulders back. Lengthen the back of your upper arms towards your elbows, and keep the chin level with the floor, keep the eyes level with one another, and then release. Now switch. So what do we do? We reach the right arm across first or the left? Left. left? Okay, now reach the right one across. Take hold of your left elbow and then your right. So the forearms are reversed this time. Press into your feet. Squeeze your legs together. Draw the navel back and lift the chest. And now roll the shoulders back, lift the chest up. And then release. All right, go ahead and take a seat. So I think it's important that we actually bring the experience into the room, right? How do we feel? OK. Anybody feel any tight areas? Oh, yeah. Anybody feel anything kind of loose enough while you did it? All right. Okay. So bringing the physical practice into the talk, right? We can talk about this for a long time, but we need to feel and experience this work. Not just in our minds, but in our whole selves. All right. Let's see here. So a little bit more about my background as a yoga teacher. Matt was mentioning, and a lot of folks have a hard time pronouncing, the certification process I went through is through a methodology of yoga called Ayengar Yoga. It's based in um, Pune, India, which is in kind of southern India on the western side of the country. Um, BKS Ayengar is the teacher or guru, was the teacher or guru for this method. So it's what we call lineage-based yoga, in that my practice is still connected to the family who developed it uh, in India. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, I'm really fortunate to still get to study with two mentors in the area who both have, I think, have combined probably 60 to 70 years of practice. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very grateful to get to be a part of a community, which is one of the similarities I find in my yoga practice to the recovery community, right? Is that this isn't just a practice I go out and do on my own. I have a whole community of support. I have mentors. I have people I can turn to for advice. And so that's something I always like to start mentioning when I talk about yoga, is that it certainly is a personal journey, and it's one that can also be rooted and grounded in community. And I want to talk to you all a little bit about what is yoga. We have a lot of media out there on what yoga is, right? Um, and it can be kind of confusing, because it can be in gyms, it can be in parks, it can be in community centers. Um, like I mentioned, there's things like lineage-based yoga, there's goat yoga, there's all kinds of yoga out there, right? 
So the root word of yoga in Sanskrit, which is the ancient Indian language that's a written form of language that many of our yogic texts come from, is yuj. And yuj means to bind, to yoke, to integrate. And so it's this integration of all parts of the self. The yoking together of all parts of the self is what the root of the word yoga means. Um, And it's much more than just a form of exercise, right? It's much more than just the poses that we put ourselves in in our body. And so the sutras of Patanjali are one of the ancient texts that a lot of yoga practices here in the States rely on. Uh, it was developed, it was written, Patanjali was this man who wrote down kind of all this like oral tradition around yoga that had been practiced for years. Uh, and he put it in one of its first written forms called the sutras of Patanjali, which is kind of like a book of verses or aphorisms that define and lay out the path to, to bliss, the path to spiritual enlightenment. And so he starts out his book by saying that yoga is the stilling of the fluctuations of the mind. So it's this quieting of the mind. And a little bit about the history of yoga. There is a lot of um, storylines about where yoga came from and what its history is. And I think there's still a lot of research being done on the roots of yoga. Um, Some some versions of the story say that yoga actually was developed 40,000 years ago in ancient Egypt, right? There's some cave markings and some... Uh, some artifacts that have been found that show yogic or meditative postures from ancient Egypt. Um, A more popular storyline is that yoga was developed from communities in northern India about 5,000 years ago. Um, And as I mentioned, some of our first text that we can find written about yoga was from about 2,500, 3,000 years ago. So regardless of what amount of years we want to put on it, it's an ancient practice. It's been around for a really long time, long long before Lululemon's been around. Um, so we've got a long, long history kind of leading us into today's version of the practice. And um, <clears throat> a lot of times, I love this question, a lot of times I get the question of, is yoga a religious practice? And it's not a religious practice. Uh, it was developed in the same region and similar time period as Buddhism Hinduism, Jainism. So you'll see a lot of similarities between those different faith groups and practices with yoga. However, it's, it's considered to be a spiritual practice. And I love this question because I get the same question in the discovery group that I lead at Dawn Farm a lot of, isn't AA a religious group? Uh, and I tell them the same thing. Like, AA can be a spiritual opportunity, but it's not a religious group, right? So again, I'm finding similarities between the yoga work I do and then the work I do in the recovery community of kind of the misconceptions of what is this community and what is this practice. And so the methodology that I engage in, Iyengar Yoga, we refer to yoga as an art. It's an art form. Um, We refer to it as a science because it's a methodology towards spiritual enlightenment or towards this integration of the whole self. And then we also refer to it as a philosophy because it's a way of knowing and understanding the world. Right. So much more than just physical postures. We're really transforming our worldview. We're transforming the eyes we see through. It's not an institutionalized religious practice, though. And similar to to the recovery community, to the 12-step method, we will refer to higher power and God when we talk about yoga. However, that's God as whoever you deem God to be, right? It can be whatever type of divine entity that you want to connect with. So there's um, there's no, like, preconceived or dogmatic way of saying this is how you need to understand or experience divinity. All right. And so yoga today... Yoga today can be a very confusing world. Um, I listed just a few. I mean, this is like, what, eight of a thousand different versions of yoga out there. Um, Vinyasa, which is a flow yoga. There's hot yoga. There's nidra yoga, which is a form of, like, preparing for sleep. Um, We're going to, like, a really deep, relaxed state. There's restorative yoga, ashtanga yoga, um, which is just a few different sequences that are done over and over again. An important thing to note about yoga in what I'll call the West, or what's kind of like Europe and the States, this side of the world, is that most of it is what we call hatha yoga. And so hatha yoga, I guess I have to give a little bit more history here. So yoga's been around for a long, long time. At the turn of the 20th century, there was this attempt to revive yoga practices. So with colonization and imperialism of all these different European countries in India, a lot of the indigenous practices kind of went by the wayside, right? They were seen as, as crude or um, not in line with the colonization that was happening, uh, and they were often shamed. And so was, there was this kind of revival through some of the maharajas or kings in India to bring back these indigenous practices such as yoga. And it actually took on more of a calisthenic, more of a physical practice than it had prior been. 
Uh, so in 1931, the Maharaja of Mysore hired a man named Krishnamacharya, who we consider the father of modern yoga. And he trained some of the main people that brought yoga into the West, that brought yoga in towards the states. Um, so a couple of those names are BKS Iyengar, who's my teacher, um, Patabi Joyce, who is the founder of Ashtanga Yoga. Um, we've got Indra Devi, who really, I think, took it first to Hollywood, actually. Um, and then Desika Char. So a lot of people who were bringing yoga into the States through aristocrats, through European royalty. Um, my teacher, BKS Iyengar, his first student in the West was actually Yehuda Menuhin, who was a famous violinist out of New York. Um, so that kind of gives us some of the, the path, too, of how yoga came here and why a lot of the issues that modern yoga teachers are facing are how do we make this practice accessible to the, to the common person, right? Not just to, like, white, wealthy pockets of the U.S., which is kind of the stereotype that follows the practice. Um, and so going back to Hatha yoga, a lot of the yoga we see due to Krishnamacharya's practice and how he trained his followers, um, Hatha means like a bounced yoga. Hot means sun, thought means moon. So it's this bounced practice of using the body in order to prepare for meditation and spiritual enlightenment, moving closer to that integration of the full self, right? So when I say spiritual enlightenment, I'll try and always follow it up because that can ring different bells for different people. But what I, what I mean is that it's this full integration of all the different parts of ourselves. So the more cliche or common way we hear that said is integrating the mind, body, and soul, right? Integrating the mind, body, and spirit. Okay, so that's kind of how yoga landed here. And um, I think when you're considering what type of yoga class should I go to, you've got a ton of options, right? Uh, I recommend that there's so many online resources to try things out via YouTube, via Yoga Glow, all these different websites that offer free yoga uh, that you can do online to kind of test out different methods. Some are going to be more supported, some are going to be quieter, some are going to be slower, while some might be more heated, more fast-paced, um, more instructional. And so testing stuff out, seeing what's a good fit for you, but knowing that if you go to one yoga class, it's probably not going to be the same as other yoga classes you go to, right? There's that much variety out there. In terms of yoga therapy, which I think um, some methods consider themselves to be therapeutic regardless of the title of yoga therapy, right? And so my method of Iyengar yoga, for example, it's always been more of a therapeutic method, working with different physical health conditions and mental health conditions. Um, <clears throat> but formal yoga therapy in the West, from more of a Western medical standard, didn't really start developing until the 1980s. And at first, it was really geared towards physical health, right? Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic pain, um, chronic fatigue, things like that. And then the last few decades, we've seen more and more research coming out on how yoga can really impact folks struggling with chronic depression, chronic anxiety, chronic stress, bipolar, schizophrenia, and addiction. And so more and more research... And, and also trauma is one of the bigger research areas around yoga right now. So looking more and more at how, how yoga clinically, how we can clinically prove uh, from a Western standpoint, a Western medical model, that yoga is impacting the health and well-being of folks. Okay. So I want to walk us through the eight limbs of yoga. I'm going to do this for a little bit, and then I actually have three panelists that are going to join us for the second half of the presentation to speak more about their experiences of how yoga and recovery intersect. Okay, um, but first I wanna walk us through what's called the eight limbs of yoga and connect, as I mentioned earlier, some of the philosophy and how it connects to recovery, as well as clinical work and physiological responses. And so the eight limbs are a system that Patanjali, that guy who wrote all the sutras 3,000 years ago, um, laid out for us as this path. So have some of us heard of like the eightfold path in Buddhism? Okay, so this is like the yoga version of it. This is how we get to that place of full integration. Um, and my teacher, BKS Iyengar, refers to this. You'll see two models of this often. One is a tree, with each one of these steps being a part of the tree, starting at the roots and working their way up to the fruit. Um, he often refers to it also as a lotus flower. So that's what's pictured here, as each petal is important for the full blossom. So each of these steps is equally important to one another. And the first are what are called the yamas. And the yamas are our ethical precepts, so our ethical disciplines. They're like the core values that we want to hold and practice in all that we do, whether it's our physical asana or posture practice or just like our day-to-day -day life. This is really the foundation of the practice. It's the roots of the practice. And it starts with one. So each of these values here, we're practicing not only in our actions, 
for practicing them in the words that we speak to one another and the words we speak to ourselves. We're also practicing them in the thoughts that we hold, right? So <clears throat> we're never going to perfect these, most likely, in our human existence here. But there's something that we're constantly trying to refine through our yoga practice. And so the first one that we see up here is ahimsa. And ahimsa means nonviolence. It means nonviolence towards others and nonviolence towards ourselves. And that's both deliberate like n avoiding deliberate violence to one another and also deliberate violence towards ourselves. And so when I was fortunate enough to do that, to build that intervention with these women in this rehab center, they actually, we got to incorporate some of the yamas in each of our classes. And they really helped me think about, whoa, some of these cross over quite a bit into early recovery and into um, this process of learning about ourselves and learning about our addictions. And so we talked a lot in that group about how this practice of nonviolence can show up in in our lives and in our yoga practice is not talking horribly to ourselves, right? Not saying judgmental things towards ourselves, not practicing that negative self-talk. Um, it also shows up in kind thoughts and kind deeds toward other people, right? So not trying to take other folks down, not um, allowing our anger to consume us and act out towards other people. Uh, and then also, I think in a really simple way, nonviolence shows up in early recovery by not using, by beginning to practice abstinence, right? Because that use of a substance is often a form of violence a form of inflicting violence on ourselves. Uh, and then we practice this yama, this foundational practice in our physical postures of yoga by noticing what we say to ourselves, right? By like not shaming ourselves or being judgmental towards ourselves when we're in the postures, if we can't do something, if um, we're not meeting our own expectations. And we practice it really, I think this is a key thing that comes up in a lot of the beginner students I work with in differentiating what's the difference between pain and discomfort. Right? And that can be a really confusing sensation when we first start engaging in a body practice, is that at first everything feels like pain. I don't really know how to differentiate that spectrum of discomfort to pain yet. And if I'm constantly avoiding it, if I'm constantly avoiding feelings of discomfort, that in itself can be a way of enacting violence on myself by denying myself opportunity to grow. Right? And I can also be self-harming by pushing through pain and not acknowledging it and not caring for it. And so learning to differentiate what are these different sensations and what do they mean. The second of our yamas is satya, which is truthfulness. Uh, that seems like it rings a bell in early recovery, right? There's, and I think this shows up in step work a lot. So there's a lot of step work that really requires us to be honest, not only with ourselves, but with our sponsor, with our peers, um, with the folks that we're making amends to, with the folks that we're trying to repair harm with. And so satya is another key principle. And it's, uh, we're not trying to like procure truthfulness we're trying to unveil truthfulness, right? So in yoga, there's this belief that there is truth inherently within us, right? And that we mask that truth by the ways that we try to protect ourselves and move through the world. And so how do we unveil that truthfulness? How do we lean into it instead of push it away, instead of trying to cover it up? All right. Uh, and then our next one up here is, aste er, is brahmacharya. And brahmacharya is continence. It also translates into control of sexual pleasure. So in the old times when yogis were like these men who lived in caves away from their communities, uh, this was celibacy. This meant no sexual engagement at all. So in the modern iterations of yoga, it's really this uh, controlling sexual or just con sexual pleasure and doing things that are like, I guess gluttonous is the word that's coming to mind, in moderation. So not exceeding the urges I have, not acting in ways that are out of bounds with, um, with caring for myself and caring for other people. Uh, and then we've got aparigraha, which means non-attachment. Also a key mindfulness practice that happens a lot in the clinical work that we do, right? And so, and again, on a basic level in recovery, non-attachment is, is non-attachment to the substances that I leaned really heavily on in my use. Right? And so being able to recognize and acknowledge those urges without having to act on them, without having to cling to them. Uh, and we practice this a lot in our asana work, in our posture work, by not holding expectations of what I'm going to show up like each day. Right? One day, maybe I'm having a really great day. I can do that pose in a really wonderful way, and it feels good. The next day, I might try the same pose, and it might feel horrible. Right? I might have a new pain or a new emotional sensation arising. And so it's that one day at a time experience in the yoga pose, just like we practice in recovery. And the last one we've got up here is asteya. And asteya means non-stealing. And so this is in a quite literal sense, right? Like not taking things from one another. Uh, we can also think of it in a more figurative sense of I'm not taking from myself, 
right? Like, am I using my time wisely? Am I using my time appropriately? Or am I, in a sense, stealing, stealing time from myself by going into my yoga practice maybe without intention or without focus? Um, <clears throat> am I not using the resources I have around me in my recovery or in my yoga practice to keep moving forward in it? Because that also, in a way, can be a way of stealing time, right? Stealing time and opportunity from myself. All right, do any of these, this is a chance for some audience participation. Do any of these uh, make connections for you all or ring out to you as values that connect to the recovery process? Yeah, what does that look, so non-attachment, what does that look like for you in the recovery process or how you correlate the two? Yeah, so non-attachment in a practice of relationships in early recovery, right? So not being able to control relationships uh, and this clinging that can happen to the expectations that we place on relationships. Yeah, anybody else see something up there that rings true to you in your recovery process? Yeah, so nonviolence, especially in those steps six and seven where we're having to be kind towards ourselves as we assess our care and others, yeah, as well as others. Yeah, it incorporates both in that, right? Kindness towards self as we look at our kindness towards others and maybe the harm we've caused in the past. Okay, let's keep moving. Um, so the next limb or pedal of the eight steps of yoga is called the niyamas. And the niyamas are the self-discipline. So these are the actions that we take on in a day-to-day way in our practices. And the first one is saucha. And saucha means cleanliness. So there we go. We're clean when we're in recovery, right? It's this not... And this is a practice in yoga as well, not putting toxins. You'll see this practice at different levels in different yoga communities, right? Like there are yoga communities that don't eat meat, that don't smoke, that don't drink alcohol, regardless of their recovery status. Um, And then you'll see kind of variations on that throughout the yoga community. But at a basic level, we're not putting toxins in the body. We're creating a clean environment for ourselves. We're also purifying ourselves through the the physical practice of yoga by moving circulation and oxygen through the body. Uh, So that cleanliness piece is is a key piece, and I'm practicing cleanliness daily by caring for myself and my environment. And the next one we have up here is santosha, and santosha means contentment. And this is kind of a byproduct of that practice of cleanliness. So when I feel pure of mind and pure of heart, that brings me to a place of contentment. And when I think of santosha, when I think of contentment, um, I think a lot about step one, right, of this acceptance of what is, and can I be content in what is. And we follow the yamas in that, right? We follow the yamas in, like, I have to be honest, I have to be nonviolent towards myself while I practice these self-disciplines. <clears throat> um, I also, when we practice this in our physical asana practice, it's, again, what I mentioned earlier, this one day at a time, right? Like, this is how I am in the practice today. How do I push myself and challenge myself while also knowing that maybe I'm not capable of doing everything that I set out to do today? Right? And can I still practice contentment and ease in that? And if we are in a place of contentment, if we're in a place of purity of mind and heart, it leaves less room for resentment, right? Because I'm approaching what I'm doing from a place of acceptance. The third one of our niyamas is tapas, which means austerity. It also is often referred to as a zealous, sustained practice. So this is our passion. Tapas is like the fire that we come in with. It's that fire that we approach recovery with when we're like, hey, I really want to get better. I want to be well. I'm going to go full into recovery. It's the energy and passion that we put into our yoga practice when we talk about how, you know, I'm, I'm doing this. Like, it was like I really relate to tapas in my early practice when I was like up at 6 a.m. every day and I was practicing for an hour and it was feeling good. I had energy and passion to go into it. And so it literally translates to energy, right, to heat. Um, and then we direct that energy through these next two which are shvadhyaya, self-study, and more classically, self-study via sacred text. So things like the sutras of Patanjali, other texts are the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, um, the Vedas, which are all other ancient yoga texts. Um, And it's this self-analyzing, this looking at ourselves, being willing to evaluate ourselves and reflect on what's going well, what's not going well. What can I better understand about myself? And we practice this first through the physical practice, first through the postures of can I objectively, honestly, non-judgmentally witness myself, right, in whatever whatever shape or pose I'm in? And then can I carry that skill in my day-to-day life? The final of the niyamas is Ishvara Pranidhana, and that is a surrender to higher power. That's a surrender to God, right? So that's a big part of our step work as well. 
Um, and in asana, one of, uh, one of my favorite quotes that my teacher says is that each asana, each posture, is a form of prayer. Right? So again, it's not a religion, but it is a practice that connects us to spiritual power. And so what if I went into every yoga posture I did with a sense of awe, with a sense of um, inspiration and connection to something greater than myself? So how about for this list? Anything ring true to y'all in terms of how this could connect to recovery? Yeah, so self-study, shvadhyaya, is like daily inventory. What else stands out to you in here in terms of how it could connect to recovery practice? Yeah, step three, right? Surrendering to God. Doing the step three as well. Okay, yeah, so there's a lot in here about what does it mean to connect to a higher power. Mm, Yeah, so the humility that comes with contentment in step six and seven. Mm Mm-hmm, step 11 through surrender to God. Yeah, so in the big book, Bill W. mentions keeping that enthusiasm for recovery, which we see in tapas, passion, zealous passion. All right, so those are our niyamas. And then our third, so we don't even get to the physical practice of yoga until the third limb, which is where we have asana and postures. And here's where I want to start to incorporate some of the quotations that I, that I collected from qualitative data I did during my research. Um, the first quote I have on here, though, is from, from my teacher, BKS Iyengar, that says, the study of asana is not about mastering a posture. So it's not about perfection of anything. It's about using posture to understand and transform yourself. Right? So the posture itself is just a container that you're doing other work in, the self-transformation work. Um, and then I've got a couple quotes up here from the women that I worked with. Uh, the first one, which you all can see on the screen here, says, I liked yoga because it helped my body. So that's often one of the first draws into the practice is that my body starts to feel better. Uh, doing the poses really helped lower back, which is actually like the number one thing that we see folks change is lower back pain. Lower back pain and high blood pressure are the two things that my students report changing the fastest. Um, and then the second quotation up here, I liked that it gave me a little more confidence as far as what I was capable of doing with my body. And like, what, what a transformation, right? Because in addiction, it's almost like our body's betraying us, right? In addiction, we have the separation of the body and the mind. Uh, they, they aren't integrated most of the time. And so this idea that in early recovery, by using and engaging my body, I'm getting to build confidence. That's a sign of like, I'm integrating all the different pieces of myself again. Right? And so there's a lot. I mean, I could, I could do a whole presentation just on what's happening. I could probably do like a series on just what's happening in the body. Um, but to point out a few things. Uh, so the nervous system is a key player when we're thinking about body work and early recovery. The nervous system is usually pretty out of sync as we enter early recovery. We're responding to agitation. We're responding to stresses in ways that are maybe out of proportion. Um, maybe we're hyper responding, we're hyperactively responding, maybe which means we're overreacting or like the not overreacting in a judgmental sense, but like the reaction is bigger than the trigger. Um, we may be hypo reacting, which is like a withdrawing or a freezing, right? So unable to engage, a depressed <laughs> nervous system. And uh, thinking of the nervous system in that way connects really well to another yoga philosophy point, which are called the gunas. And the gunas are three ways of describing kind of energy in our body. Uh, which I use a lot in classes to help students self-identify how they're feeling. The first guna is tamas, and that means like heaviness, density, cold, uh, kind of inert, this like hard feeling. And that connects really closely to our parasympathetic nervous system, which is our freeze part of the nervous system. So it connects to the lower part of our body, like our gut, and it's it's what withdraws us. It freezes us in our stress response, right? And so we can feel that energy in stiffness. We can feel that energy when we feel lethargic. That's tamas. Um, The second guna is rajas. And rajas means heat. It means movement. It means fluctuation. Uh, I think of it as like a faster-paced form of energy. And that connects really well to our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight-or-flight part of our nervous system. Right? It's the part of our nervous system that says, get the heck out of here. Get away from whatever that, that frustration or irritation or thing that's triggering the emotional response in me is. And then the third guna is sattva. And sattva is kind of this like clear, light, integrated, um, soft, open feeling. This feeling of clarity or knowing. And that connects really well to our, our ventral vagal system, um, which is in the face. It connects the face and the heart together. And that's actually what the part of our nervous system that helps us connect engage with, and engage with other humans. So in a healthy stress response, we're actually triggered through that vagal nerve to connect with another human, to reach out for support. 
And part of what incorporating the body in this practice does is it settles and reintegrates those three parts of the nervous system. So we're not just reacting out of our high stress, like our freezing part of our nervous system. We're not just reacting out of this fight or flight part of the nervous system, but we're regulating those and bringing those back into sync so that we're reacting in this healthier way that actually encourages connection and integration. Uh, so that's like a simple, that's a simple description of what's happening in the yoga postures. Um, like I said, there's tons of research out there on how it's impacting um, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, how it's impacting all these different endocrine systems and circulatory systems in the body as well. But overall, we're moving the body, right? I think on a really simple level, a key piece of this is that we're increasing circulation throughout the body, which means we're increasing blood flow and oxygen throughout the body. So we're waking up. We're bringing aliveness to parts of the body that maybe haven't experienced it in a long time. The fourth of our limbs is pranayama, and pranayama is breath control. Prana actually translates to cosmic energy. So it's not just controlling the breath, but it's controlling the cosmic energy that's held on the breath. Um, I don't know if any of us really get to the place where we're controlling cosmic energy, but even if we're just controlling breath, it's a great, it's a great thing. And so a couple of quotations here are that, um, that I have from the women I worked with are, the breathing techniques help to calm myself down and not take everything so personal. Right? So it's taking me away from that external trigger and bringing me back into myself by tying my mind to the breath, by binding my mind to the breath. The second quotation here is that it helped me. I learned how to breathe when I'm about to panic. And so again, that's showing how when the sympathetic, that fight or flight nervous system is activated, tying in the breath helped bring in the vagal nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system to bounce out the hyper reaction. So just by connecting the mind to the breath, we quieted. Right? And so let's, let's actually try this for a moment. I've got to keep a microphone with me. Um, when we breathe in, we stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. So that, that rajas, that heat, that fluctuation, which in moderation is okay. It's just when it gets an excess that it's too much. And then when we breathe out, we trigger the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the quieting part of the nervous system, which again, in moderation, when in balance, it's healthy. If we let it overcome, that's when we go into like the depressed withdrawn states. So let's notice kind of what's happening throughout the body as we take a breath in through the nostrils, activating that sympathetic nervous system, and then take a breath out through the nose or the nostrils, bringing in that quieting nervous system. And then do one more, taking a breath in through the nostrils, and exhaling, taking a breath out through the nostril or nose. And just through that simple act, you're starting to participate in your nervous system. Right? It's not just this unconscious thing that's happening. You're influencing it by bringing that attention to your breath. And so really, I mean, pranayama, there's a dozen or more different forms of pranayama, some sitting, some lying down, some with your fingers closing a nostril. But in a simple way, it's, we're participating in what was formerly an unconscious act in the body. Right? We're bringing that alertness and aliveness to a part of the body that we formerly didn't have any control over. All right, our next one here is pratyahara, which is a withdrawal of the senses. So it's instead of using our senses to gauge our surroundings, we're using our senses to gauge our inner world, to start to interpret our inner world rather than our outer world. And so this, this quote I really love, it says, you learn to go into you and in everything. There could be a car wreck outside, but you stay in tune with you, and that car wreck stays out there. And she talks further on in this quote about how, but prior, she would have reacted to the car wreck, right? The car wreck would have been an excuse to come out of herself and pay attention to that exciting thing that was happening outside. And instead, through her practice, in just eight weeks, she's starting to recognize, when I witness a car wreck outside, I can choose to tune in and center on myself, and I don't have to have anything to do with what's happening out there. Right? And so pratyahara, this withdrawal of the senses, is, um, <clears throat> is preparing us for meditation. Right? Meditation isn't something that many of us can do, and the word meditation kind of gets floated around loosely in the world as well. Um, in, in the method I practice, we consider meditation to be all parts of myself tuned into the core of myself, right? Which I think is a rare occurrence in this world. Um, so pratyahara is that preparation work. So when I'm doing my yoga postures, can I stay away from my cell phone, right? Can I continue to notice in a in a focused way what's happening in my body with all my senses. Um, and that can take years, it can take decades to develop that skill. But it's something I'm continuously trying to fine tune and refine. All right, next we have dharana, which means concentration. And in this sense, concentration is focusing on a single point, 
Can I focus on one point? So let's say I'm doing triangle pose. Can I keep my attention focused on my right foot? Right? Can I notice how that right foot, the sensations waver in it as I stay in it? Maybe I'll do another pose. Can I stay focused on my right foot? So what, can I train my mind to learn to pinpoint its focus and awareness on something? Um, and I liked how this client here described the impact that that had on her, right? So here she is, yoga helped me a lot as far as keeping my cool and learning how to think before I react out of anger. And so noticing the anger, but that's not where my concentration is, right? The anger can be something that ripples off me and my concentration can stay focused on me. So we're training and tuning ourselves into that in our physical postures so that it becomes a practice when moments like someone bothering me come up, right? Or when I feel triggered to use or... Um, when I'm in a relationship that's really toxic and hard and I want to react in a certain way. Uh, our seventh limb here is dhyana. And dhyana is where we finally get to meditation. And this, this quotation's a great one. It was actually in regard to a fight over a bag of chips that went missing, uh, which I think is just like such a great example, right? Because it's not like a big deal. I mean, like, it's, it's, it felt like a big deal in that moment for some of the people there. But when we think of the grand scheme of recovery, it's usually these little things that get to us, right? Um, we do all this preparation for the big events that might trigger us, and it's the little things like my bag of chips going missing. Uh, and so she refers here to one of the most impactful things in this intervention that we tried out around yoga was her meditation. And that she learned to, especially living in a building, sharing bedrooms with a, with a bunch of women in early recovery and detox, she learned to step away from that chaos, <clears throat> as she described it, and move into her happy place that she created. Um, so the place where she could go just by shutting her eyes and leave all the chaos, everything that was happening around her away, including this fight about the bag of potato chips. And so meditation is sustained concentration, using all parts of ourselves to sustain concentration on the core of ourselves. So that's one way that we see that happening. And this is where we really start to get into some of the clinical methods being used today. So things like dialectical behavioral therapy. Right? For anyone who's, who's experienced that through Dawn Farm, we know the what and the how skills and mindfulness. Right, So I'm learning to observe, I'm learning to uh, describe, and I'm learning to fully participate in something in a mindful, one-minded, non-judgmental, and effective way. We need those skills in order to sustain a meditative practice, in order to sustain a meditative mindset. All right, the last of our limbs, this is the fruit on the tree. Profound absorption, a sense of oneness a full integration of the self. And I love, I love all these quotes. Um, I was fun to read through all this research I'd done a few years ago again, um, and a lot of it stood out to me. And it's just like I read these things, and I'm like, oh, my God, they got it. It was just eight weeks, and they felt it, right? And here's this woman who said that the practice relaxed her, and it opened her up. It gave her a sense of freedom. And that's really what samadhi is. It's this liberation. It's this liberation from all the things that pull us away from ourselves, including our attachment to substances, our addiction. Um, it's, it's allowing ourselves to open up to our truest self, to our highest self, right? To the divine, the sacred, whatever we want to call it, but it's that integrating all the pieces of ourselves in a form of liberation. And I think that's it. I've listed a few resources up here um, that I want to mention before we move into the panel. Uh, and the first one is a free movie that you can find on YouTube, and it's called Addiction, Recovery, and Yoga. It was developed in 20, or 2009 by a man named Lindsay Clinnell, who's another Iyengar yoga teacher, although he, he resourced interviews from folks who, from all different methodologies, who are students and teachers and practitioners in recovery. And it's a really beautiful film that kind of ties in the 12-step process with the practice of yoga. Um, I listed a version of the Sutras of Patanjali here. There's also a great book out called The Visual Aids of Trauma Therapy that goes into more detail on some of those trauma responses that I talked about and how the physiological body responds to it. Um, and then at Dawn Farm, we're reading The Body Keeps Score right now. So if, that's, if you want a more heady, heady book on what's happening to the body and why it's important to incorporate body practices in our healing processes, um, that's a good one to read. And I'm sure our panelists are going to have more information for us as well. Uh, so any questions before we transition? Anything standing? We'll have some more time for questions at the very end as well. But any questions right now before we hear from a few other folks? Okay. So I'm going to invite up Marie, Shiv, and Shadima to join us on stage. Uh, and they're each going to share kind of what brings them here, what their connection is to these practices. And we'll leave some space for questions for myself and for the three of them at the very end. <laughs> Hi. My name is Marie. Um, I am in recovery myself, and I'm a yoga instructor. 
um, which I will get into more detail about soon. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about my personal experience and how I came to connect with yoga and how it helps with my recovery. Um, I got into yoga in a pretty strange way. I was a very slumpy, slouchy child. I was really shy. Um, and in my 20s, I decided that giving an eight-year-old a piggyback ride would be a great idea. My back, slouchy as it was, did not agree. Um, so I had a back injury, and I, like many people, figured yoga would be a good idea to help. Um, it did. I gained a lot of strength, um, and I was feeling very good about myself, and I decided that I wanted to make this more of a career. Um, it wasn't until going into my yoga teacher training where I learned all the things that you learned up here with the eight limbs, the yamas, the niyamas, all of the content um, and the philosophy of what yoga was about. It's not just poses and putting yourself in like a pretzel position um, and slouchy, scared little child me really didn't like learning this stuff. Um, I was really forced to take a good, hard look at myself and see all the ways that I was really holding myself hostage and trying to live up to all these expectations of others. Um, and it was destroying me. And I really just thought I was a sad person until yoga was like, no, um, there's a better way. <laughs> and. Um, I guess as a metaphor, I'd say I was sort of like a house that was not being maintained well. You know, as a child, I would withhold food from myself. I withheld myself from social situations because I didn't think that I deserved them. I was really not nice to myself. Um, so if you were to think of a house that uh, has never had its roof replaced, or has never been cleaned. Um, I was sick, and my house was crumbling, and it was moldy and gross. Um, not a good place to live. That, I think, w is what really opened up the hardest part of my life. So it's, it's funny to say now, in recovery, yoga actually took me down a pretty dark path in my life before it got better. I really had to gut out a lot of this house. And as I was um, you know, scraping out all of the mold and I was um, you know, breaking down walls, metaphorically, in my real life I was analyzing my relationships and my career choice and who I really was at my foundation. And I really had to tear myself down to a very basic skeleton of a person and then build myself back up. During those times where I was really in this restoration process, alcohol was a really helpful thing because I was looking at a lot of gross things that I really wanted to avoid working on. Um, however, I stuck with yoga. And I actually had to go through my teacher training twice, because the first time around, I was learning a lot about myself. There's no way I could teach anyone else. Um, so uh, just like in recovery, it's been a process. And um, like in a lot of our poses, the end result is not really the goal. That's not the purpose of what we're doing in yoga. It's the experience on the way there. And it's the noticing of the day-to-day -day changes in your mind, in your body, in your soul, both in the real world, off of your mat, and on your mat. Um, and I'm really happy to say that today I've been in recovery for about 15 months. And I am teaching classes um, called Yoga for Recovery. They're free 
to the public through an amazing recovery program called Families Against Narcotics. Um, and uh, it was just really serendipitous that we found each other and that I have now built a very still growing, lovely, livable home <laughs> as a person and as a house. And um, if you guys are interested in Yoga for Recovery, it's a really just a place where you can be safe and you can be where you are at the moment. I like to tell students, like, you can take a nap if that's what you're feeling today. You know, sometimes it's hard and it's challenging and you got to struggle. And that's what that surrender is about, too, is, you know, just being where you are and sticking with it and embracing the suck and really just just uh, growing and just being you. Um, so there will be flyers for the Yoga for Recovery classes. Um, and I really thank Erin for putting this on. Um, I am very honored to be able to speak my part of this. And thank you. Thank you. So my name is Chidima, and uh, I have been teaching yoga for, in February 2020, it will be 11 years uh, that I've been teaching yoga, and I've been taking yoga for a little bit longer than that. Uh, I found yoga when I lived in Las Vegas. Um, I lived there for about 10 years, and I will tell you that the first time I went to my mat, uh, I didn't know what the big deal was. I thought that, uh, I just thought everyone else was wrong about yoga. Um, and it turns out that I was the one that was wrong about yoga. Um, I will say that uh, I had, a significant spiritual awakening, maybe we could call it. Um, and a month after I got to my yoga mat, and then I could not have enough yoga. And so I was taking classes, a lot of classes, and within a year of um, kind of coming back to the mat, so, so I took a yoga class, hated it, didn't come back to the mat for maybe six months, I think. Uh, that's what it was. So after my first yoga class a month later, kind of some things happened, um, and I started to transform. And then six months after my first yoga class, I took another, my second class, and I loved it. And I was like, where have you been all my life? Uh, <laughs> perspective, right? It's perspective. And then a year after my second yoga class, I was a certified yoga teacher and I had gone through my first 200 hour uh, yoga teacher training. And I've gone through several 200 hours. I've gone through a 500 hour. I'm actually a certified yoga therapist as well. And uh, I say this not because it means anything. It, it means that you're in safe hands when you come to my class. Uh, but also because uh, I am always a student uh, I am someone that is within, um, I'm a recovery advocate. Uh, I have a social justice podcast and the topics that I talk about primarily besides social justice issues are uh, three specific social justice issues and one of which is I speak with a lot of folks that are uh, recovering from substance use disorder, um, those that have uh, that are living with mental illness, as well as those that have um, survived intimate partner violence, something that we also know, uh, know as domestic violence, and then uh, also sexual assault. And so there is data that supports that all three are kind of related. And where does yoga come into the play? Uh, yoga can be very therapeutic for folks, especially if someone is uh, so data supports that folks that uh, may be called, um, it, 
people that are in recovery, uh, substance use disorder, alcoholism addiction, whatever you want to call it, I'm not necessarily uh, a stickler for those things. Uh, to that known self be true is what I say. So if someone comes to a recovery community, whichever one it is, it's likely that that person needs to be there. Uh, most folks don't kind of tumble into recovery communities by accident, uh, but perhaps they do, I don't know. So with that said, if you are there and you found recovery, it's possible that you've had some trauma in your life prior to landing in recovery. And uh, it is also possible that you could be self-medicating or you could have been self-medicating because there's other things that were going on. And you didn't perhaps have the support or resources to uh, manage it on your own. So yoga can be helpful for that. Uh, if you are breathing, you've likely experienced trauma and uh, that could be trauma from uh, sexual abuse. It could be trauma from multiple motor vehicle accidents. It could be trauma from surgery. It could be trauma from anything. And a lot of us, when we have experienced trauma, we do not feel safe in our bodies. Uh, Aaron mentioned some of the yoga foundations that can help with this stuff. Um, so physical is just one of the pieces. Uh, there is that connection to the divine, whatever that means or doesn't mean to you. Uh, it is, there is that connection with the breath. And so when I teach, I teach students, I say it's not about the yoga, but it's not not about the yoga because the yoga can be a metaphor for life. Uh, if someone is working through poses and building up to a pose, it could be a, a a pose that they've been working on for a really long time. It could be one of those poses that if you're scrolling through social media, you're like, wow. It could be one of those poses. And that can also mean when you, because I teach on the mat yoga and off the mat yoga. So that can mean building up to asking your supervisor or boss for a raise. That could mean asking your partner to uh, take the next step with you. That could mean telling your partner, I'm going here and you're going to stay here. It could be any number of things uh, that the yoga is teaching you on the mat so that you're able to replicate it in real life, right? It also is the breath. So how many folks that happen to be in recovery have been in a 12-step recovery meeting or if like faith perspective or faith tradition is your thing and you go to meet with others that have that same faith perspective and the parking lot, that is really where we see a lot of spirituality or lack thereof, right, in the parking lot. It's like racing to somewhere and racing out of somewhere and it's like, am I the person that is quick to lay on my horn because people just aren't doing it the right way. Like they're not driving the right way, they're not living the right way, they're not even breathing the right way, right? Or am I going to, as I'm breathing, inhale and exhale, and it, that's where the pause is, and the pause is where the divine is for me. It could mean the same for you or something different. And then I'm going to actually behave the way that I know that I can behave and be my best uh, compared to kind of that first layer of not my best and the reaction rather than the response, right? So when I'm teaching uh, students, whether I'm doing one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I don't, it's not called training, but one-on-one -on -one, um, teaching or if I'm teaching in a class, that is what I'm teaching. It's the breath, it's the breath, it's the breath. Because the movement is really not the point, but it's not not the point also. So recovery and yoga can really be connected. It can be uh, a therapeutic service uh, that comes alongside a recovery program. It can be, uh, I'm one of those folks that, however you get to recovery for you, uh, if it's working, I support that. Uh, so it just kind of depends and connecting with folks that are part of your community that know you and uh, will tell you the truth about yourself is incredibly important because some folks need a lot of different things for their recovery and some folks need less. So it's just kind of figuring and navigating what works best for you.
Thank you. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Shiv. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, 15th District Court Hospital and Washna Fan that I'm here today. And I'm here today the way I am today, uh, not the way I won't like myself anymore. Uh, I would like to start with one of the most beautiful struggles in my life right now is life and recovery. Because growing up, I was always kind of a person who was more connected to learning rather than understanding. So I, I always took things, my perspective about things was always in a way where you start a thing and then you finish it up and then you achieve it. Uh, that's how, that's where my journey of struggle starts. Um, but now I'm uh, trying to uh, stay in the process of learning and processing, even with life and recovery, that it's a never-ending process. And tools like 12-step program and yoga uh, are very helpful, especially with my addictive personality, because I can get addicted to anything. Um, I would like to tell a little bit about myself. I grew up in uh, Gujarat. It's a western state back in India. And I was introduced to yoga in my second grade, but I was always learning yoga. I never understood yoga. So uh, I have lived a willful life, and I'm a similar person even today, that I do most of the things from my will. And I looked at yoga the way I wanted to. I practiced yoga the way I wanted to, and I only practiced the stuff I wanted to. I never, I learned the principles, the five principles, but I never practiced them. I never understood them. And uh, at the age of 23, when uh, my perfect planned life was not working anymore, and I experienced a couple of uh, headaches or um, glitches in my plan, uh, I, so I always did ha practiced handstands, uh, headstands, sirshasana. I always practiced that throughout my journey of life. So when things were in glitches, the only thing that came in my mind was inversion. I inversed my belief system. I inversed what was good to bad and what was bad to good. So I changed the whole dynamics of my functionality and uh, picked up a drink uh, and uh, got into drinking problem and then alcoholism. Uh, at the and thanks to the justice system, uh, I was shown some light of hope. Uh, but when I again when I started my 12-step program, something was missing. I was getting my emotional, mental, and uh, experience cure. I was feeling some relief that obsession was lifted a little bit, but I was still an insecure person. Like, my spirit, my mind, and my body, they were not connected yet. They were good in their own place. And uh, thanks to Washna Fan, I took my first yoga class, free yoga class. I was practicing my handstand through the time, but I was not with, in a sharing experience, uh, in a sharing atmosphere where everybody's uh, without any judgments, trying to do some yoga postures. And some humble teachers are explaining what are we doing, how it's related to recovery. And uh, something changed in me. Uh, I stopped comparing myself with myself. I just started doing the actions I was suggested. Uh, I started looking at things differently without even realizing them. And by, by that, I gave, I, tried to give up my habit of learning instead of understanding. Now, that helped me to work on my steps, not to learn them, but to actually put some effort in doing them uh, with the help of people. So yoga kinda, kind of gave me the, uh, the foundation to connect my mind, body, and spirit. And now I, I don't even expect from myself that I will be perfect ever, because I just want to stay in the journey. And when, especially times like this, when I'm extremely nervous and anxious and a little bit scared too, uh, yoga 
yoga helps, meditation helps, so that I can be just be instead of what I need to speak, what I need to do. Uh, so the, the great thing about this uh, four months of yoga journey was I, was, I still don't know most of the yoga po don't know the names of the yoga poses I do with uh, other people. Uh, but then I don't have to learn it, you know. Now I can just do it and get the fruits inse instead of how it works. Now I can just do it into the action. And I'm really grateful for yoga in my life because of that. Uh, Yep, I have a lot of notes, but nothing will make sense right now, so... <laughs> uh, all I want to say is, the way life... When I was doing... I remember there was a song in the background and I was doing a pose. I don't know the name, I'm sorry. But I realized something, that even two parts of my body are very different when I'm doing the same pose. Even... That's not in my control. And I'm trying to change the world. I'm, I'm up, I, I, I used to drink over global warming, I mean, <laughs> for real. And so like, all I can, yoga has taught me that all I can control is my breathing, my bodily movements, for me and for others. And then, that's it. Nothing else I can control. So my first step was completed right there. I never <laughs> had a doubt about my acceptance anymore. Because all I can do is some poses. In, in yoga, outside of yoga, in life, you know. And uh, I was not doing this yoga by myself. I was not led there. Something else brought me there. And something else was helping me to do that. So whether I believed in, believed in God or not, it was there in some form. And rest of, uh, after that point, my journey changed. Uh, I'm still a very insecure person. But I look forward to my Thursday yoga class because that's my that's been my safe place, mm -hmm. and because when I and once I'm there and now I'm going back home, the only thing in my mind is how good I feel right now, mm -hmm. and what do I need to do tomorrow to feel the same way. That gives me a little bit of motivation to do some poses next morning when I wake up, mm -hmm. or a day after that. And if I don't, yoga also teaches me that don't be harsh on yourself. It's okay, you know. So that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, so I love, I was really excited to get to invite these folks in, and I think it demonstrates kind of the lived experience of what does yoga look like when we actually do it um, in the students that we're interacting with or in our own practices and how it impacts our recovery. I'm wondering if anybody has any questions for myself or the panelists. So the podcast that has a lot of information about recovery is called the Type A Hippie Podcast. The Type A Hippie Podcast, because I'm a Type A Hippie. <laughs> T-Y-P-E-A-H-I-P-P-I-E dot com. So we're looking, I just want to make sure I repeat the questions for us. So if you're on a tight budget, where can you find some recovery focus or any kind of yoga? Uh, and we've got the fan yoga that happens in Ipsy and Ann Arbor. There's flyers on the table outside. Do you want some more suggestions? Yes. Okay. So, I have one and I'll let the panelists yeah. share too. So Red Yoga does some free drop-in classes. Red Yoga is located on East Liberty. Uh, downtown uh, Ann Arbor and various yoga studios in Ann Arbor will do a free class on the schedule and then you can also look to see um, what drop-in classes are like a lot of times your first class may be free or maybe seriously discounted, so that's an option. Uh, I do want to acknowledge, thank you for that question. One of the reasons when Aaron was uh, doing the demonstration I didn't stand up was not because I'm not able to stand up, but because if there was anyone else in the room that could not stand up, I wanted to be seated with them in case they wanted to do it. Because yoga has in the US in particular, and some may roll their eyes and I'm okay with that, is it's turned into white women that are thin. And that's not yoga at all, uh, especially when it started in India and there aren't really the number of white women that are thin in U India where it began. So we have to consider 
all of this, right? And that is part of the discussion. Uh, in addition, I teach from a point of view and lots of other yoga teachers that I know, yoga for everybody. So everybody, but everybody, right? Because we do want it to be accessible uh, and inclusive as well. So, and then Groupon is the third thing that I was going to mention before I pass the mic to Aaron. There are times that you will get a really good deal. Like the first month will almost be like a dollar a day. I'm not in your wallet or in your budget, so I don't know if even $30 for a month of yoga is feasible. I just do want to ex let folks know that Groupon or, I, I think Groupon's the one that's around here. There is a Living Social might be another one that I don't know if it's still available, but those type of kind of online um, presences can perhaps be a ticket to yoga. Yeah, thank you, Shadima. Um, another suggestion I have is the Ann Arbor School of Yoga on Huron, across from the Y. They do a $5 community class on Sundays at four o'clock. Uh, and then I would also, and I know not, I don't know where y'all are living, but I'm guessing you don't want to travel to Hamtramck. But my studio does what we call community gift or donation classes, which more and more studios are starting to pick up. Mm -hmm. And then we also offer work trade. So similar, there's mm -hmm. this culture too of like kind of service commitments within the yoga community, at least the ones that I've been a part of, mm -hmm. where we'll exchange kind of like helping keep the studio tidy for classes. That's really uh, so. If you feel comfortable asking the places that you want to be studying at, um, do you all offer anything that could mm -hmm. so, like help me out in affording this and consistently attending this? Because it is a social issue, like Shadima mentioned, that's being raised um, among certain parts of the yoga community, right? Is we're trying to aim to diversify our classes. We're trying to make this a more accessible classes in terms of like what bodies are present, in terms of what economic levels are present, like all of it. So we want to be making sure that this isn't the aristocratic practice that started out in the USS, but that we're returning to the core of it. Because in India, I mean, in India, like, this was just, you did this with your family in your living room, you know? It wasn't like, you didn't have to go to a special place and have special clothes and special equipment to do it. It was like a daily practice. Um, so we're trying to return, a lot of us are trying to return to that kind of approach. Lululemon does not have the market cornered on yoga, just saying. Go or in yoga whatever wear. clothes you feel comfortable yeah, exactly. in. <laughs> Any other questions for the panelists? That's a great question. So the question is, how do you, what do you look for in a yoga place? Like, how do you know what's a, what's a good type of yoga for you? What's a bad type of yoga for you? How do you discern among this very large market? Any panelists have some ideas on that? I have another uh, response to your question back there. YouTube. So YouTube, you can watch full classes or like their yoga, uh, Instagram famous type of yoga people like there are folks with huge followings that sometimes that do yoga classes so you could do full classes um, through YouTube I forgot about that uh, finding out what can work for you uh, part of that so one of my trainings is yoga medicine and so the goal is for uh, medical practitioners to refer someone to my someone like me um, and I would do an evaluation for you and then kind of the prescription is yoga uh, so that can be something so if someone wants to talk to me after this I am open to chatting with folks after this the other thing that's a little bit more broad and open would be to uh, look at um, descriptions of classes in some of the places that we've mentioned because they should be providing information about what type of class it is. And so there's hot yoga. If you know that you don't like to be hot, then I would suggest don't go to a hot yoga class. Uh, restorative yin classes tend to be really great beginning um, yoga classes. They're great for advanced practitioners. They're great for folks that are new that are recovering from injury. Uh, gentle yoga tends to be a great starting point as well. And then some folks jump right in into a vinyasa or a hot yoga. Uh, it just kind of depends on what your preference is. And I don't want to say your ability because I don't want to tell you what you can do, uh, you get to figure that out and that's part of the yoga journey. So the second question, or the add-on question to that was do they all incorporate like the philosophy material? Um, my experience, well, to be, so to be honest, I'm quite biased towards my tradition, it's the main one I've been studying and I don't know a ton about what other classroom settings look like. Uh, I don't know if they all, I don't think that they all do. Um, I don't. Yeah, I'm getting head shakes from the, from the, panelists up here too. So I wouldn't say this is like an across the board. It really depends on 
where folks have gotten their trainings, um, how long they've been training, how long they've been studying. So, so we have to think also about your, like American history and what we do to things once we get them. So, um, and history backs it up. I, I'm not making this up. I'm just restating history. So, we like to take out sometimes the good parts and just do it. So, in the U.S. and in the West, so U.S. and Europe, it's a lot of physical because folks don't really want to hear all this. I mean, I'm not one of those folks, but a lot of times people just tune you out and they're not interested in that. So every school or every yoga space is different in terms of how much. Some of us infuse it in there uh, and we get away with it because of our personalities and because students like what we're teaching and the music's right and the heat's right, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of them are not like this at all. So. Yeah, and uh, my studio does like a philosophy specific class. So we have our Austin Our Posture classes and then we also do a philosophy study group. Um, so you may find that at some studios as well. Mm -hmm. But I think the broader question is like, you got, it's kind of like finding a therapist. It's kind mm -hmm. of like any of these other things in our healing right. practices. We're not gonna like the first massage therapist That's we go right. to maybe. And so we gotta kind of test out the waters and see yeah. what works and doesn't work. So we just got a suggestion from the audience member to check out Insight Timer, which is one of many free apps that help That's us right. build in. The, uh, the Call Map is another one. There's a whole lot of them <coughs> out there if you do like a, a web search for meditation apps with free services. Thank and, you for that. And that breath, that's yoga. It's not just the movement. The breath is really what it is. All right, so the PC Alano Club, Saturdays at 1, a good yoga class. Thank you. Any other, we, got, we have time for maybe one more question or, or resource share. We got one. Yeah, so there's another commonality with recovery, right, is we test out meetings. We can also test out yoga classes to find the ones we like. All right. So I'll be hanging out for a few minutes after if folks want to come up and talk with me. And maybe, I don't know what our panelists are planning on, but you can try and catch one of them too. Uh, I think just the note I want to leave us on is that yoga is just another opportunity to practice, right? So in the mindfulness group I lead at Don Farm, we talk a lot about how every moment we're practicing something and we're growing what we practice, right? And so yoga is just yet another container within which we get to build and grow what we want to be, who we want to be. And so I hope that you all find a practice that works well for you. And if you have questions, let me know. Thank you. Thank you.